Partnering for Green Growth and the Global Goals for 2030, or P4G as it's known, the summit was held last weekend virtually, ending on Monday. And while private and public partnerships were highlighted during the summit as world leaders, business heads and entrepreneurs gathered together to discuss the green way forward for the globe. And as the global community move, moves forward, we take a look at how two companies have been putting partnerships into practice to achieve sustainability in both urban and rural settings. And for this, I'm joined by Kim Friedrichsland, CEO of Clean, an environmental cluster in Denmark that connects researchers, industries and public authorities to support clean and green business ventures. And we also have Pak Tion, Managing Director of JH Sustain, an international development consulting agency based here in Seoul, uh, specialising in water and climate change. A very warm welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us. And well, we're ready to go straight into the questions. And we'll be starting with you, Kim, uh, joining us at the very early hours um, in Denmark. Now, the last P4G conference, it was actually held in your, uh, in your city, your capital of, um, sorry, your Danish city of Copenhagen, which has been a shining example, really, of how even modernized cities are really pursuing sustainable solutions to urban challenges. So what are the biggest sustainability issues that modern cities face as they attempt to go green? And what systems do you think need changing? Well, uh, a lot of people and an increasing number of people uh, live in cities uh, and the, the ecological footprint of that, uh, both in terms of, of, of carbon, uh, but also in, in resources in general, uh, is a big challenge. Um, uh, uh, but it's also uh, a little bit more than that. Uh, uh, a lot of citizens live in, in cities and, and engaging these citizens in, uh, in the issues is also a, a, a a challenge. Now, uh, uh, the main environmental uh, problems in most cities is air and and water pollution and waste generation, and and a lot of the uh, air pollution comes from the burning of uh, fossil fuels. And in in cities, that's got a lot to do with buildings. Uh, so so that's a big part of the problem. Uh, also, I think in in Korea, there's a big potential uh, related to uh, uh, to energy consumption and burning of fossil fuels in buildings, although. Uh, your total footprint is, is very dominated by your industrial activities because you have so many of them. But, but I think there's a lot of potential in Korea as well. Uh, so short term, uh, uh, the, a lot of the technological solutions uh, need uh, to, to change. Uh, but, but fortunately, uh, a lot of those solutions are known or under development. Uh, but I think longer term, uh, the key to sustainability requires a bit more systemic change and cultural change because we need to learn how to consume less resources and, and still be living happy lives. And of course, sustainability is the key word that is a key factor in development, Tian. And you've been, as a company, you've been striving to achieve this in the Asia Pacific region in particular. So, why are partnerships between different actors crucial to helping communities achieve inclusive and, again, sustainable growth um, compared to those government centered sort of uh, foreign aid models that we saw in the past? Uh, sustainable development can be defined development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Since the announcement of importance of Keeping for Human Environment in Stockholm Conference in 1972, and which highlights a path forward identifying partnerships as a way to sustainable development and after long history of a paradigm shift on global commitments in 2015 as we all know 17 sustainable development goals have been adopted and SDG 1 to end poverty in all its forms everywhere and SDG 6 to secure clean water and sanitation and SDG 13 to take urgent action to combat climate change every kind of SDG is actually in ha needs to have enabling environment for SDG 17 that's partnership and yes as you pointed out we have been focusing on the Asia and the Pacific region, and today water-related disasters is one of the greatest risks the region is facing. And with the best disaster events, 
in some form of water-related disasters affecting hundreds of millions, and within some years, we are expecting billions of people annually across the region. And JH Sustain, we have participated in developing ASEAN Water Development 2020 report led by ASEAN Development Bank for assessment of, of water security as uh, water-related disaster security. So in that sense, capacity enhancement of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation is not possible to drive by government-centered foreign aid but partnerships between public and private and direct beneficiary as community efforts for raising awareness and active response. So as time goes by, issues are getting severe here and there, and government-centered planning programs and resource mobilization has limitation to accelerate the process for solving the various issues in daily lives of people and could be biased with the lack of understanding real life of a community and people. And that is why we emphasize collaborative governance with multi-stakeholder partnership in uh, objective of P4G and these kinds of partnering for green growth. Right, and of course all this collaboration, the partnership works best when it's organic and it's happening and generated from real need. And Kim, well, your company really enables this kind of bottom-up approach and you bring different actors together to make collaborations happen with your triple helix approach. So what efforts has, uh, has Denmark been making to turn cities into clean net zero settlements and what has been your role in all of this? Well, the, the, the biggest uh, city in uh, in Denmark is obviously Copenhagen, the, the capital, and I think they, they have uh, done uh, a lot of things actually. Uh, first of all, already uh, back in 2012, they, uh, they set the ambition of net zero. Uh, so politically, they were able to uh, uh, to agree on on that as an ambition, and they have uh, made and worked uh, uh, with climate action plans uh, in a very holistic and comprehensive fashion. It's now in the third phase. Uh, the results are, are are encouraging. They've they've been able to uh, reduce the carbon footprint per capita uh, by almost 60 percent already. There's still a way to go. They have uh, a focus on energy consumption, energy production, uh, mobility, uh, and and different city initiatives. Uh, cities represent uh, a, a big uh, purchasing volume, and they can affect uh, uh, a, a lot of things by their own uh, uh, procurement. But I think what has also been interesting to see in Copenhagen is is the, uh, they they focus on on the citizen engagement and welfare also. So as an example. Uh, the the, uh, the water of, of the uh, inner harbors in in the city of, of Copenhagen has been cleaned up, uh, which is obviously good for the, the environment. But it's actually uh, so good water quality that the citizens of Copenhagen they can actually swim uh, in uh, in the inner city harbor. So there's a lot of of, of swimming pools now uh, in the harbor waters. Or uh, uh, they recently built a, a big waste incineration plant, uh, but they designed it in such a way that there's an artificial ski slope uh, on top of the building. Uh, and I think this uh, um, they uh, they have a focus not only on uh, on the footprint, but also on on uh, on the livability uh, of the city for the citizens. Now, now, clean as a uh, as a as a, uh, a collaboration organization with focus on innovation. Uh, our uh, we we support uh, these uh, uh, political ambitions where we can by being a, a, a neutral uh, go-between and a and a non-profit organization. Obviously, uh, we uh, uh, we provide the. The, the connection and the engagement with the business community, uh, with focus on small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, and then we we know the craft of of uh, fundraising and project administration uh, uh, in these types of, of publicly funded projects. Uh, so that's the role we play. Wow! So really helping these ideas turn into actual policies and changing the way we live and water into quality that's clean enough to swim in. So that's all very exciting stuff. And well, Tion, you've been focusing on water management and sanitation. So how have how have you been addressing this issue, especially in the Mekong area? And well, what needs did the region have, and how are you finding solutions through partnerships? Uh... 
80% of people in downstream of the Mekong River are farmers, and the region has much economic development potential with much water and uh, quality land, but in the rainy season, around 70% of the region suffered from the flood. And economic damage across the area is around 70 million US dollars, and two-thirds of the damage is from Vietnam and Cambodia. On the other hand, in the dry season, severe drought causes the lowest farming productivity. So this region is kind of struggling from the mixture of uh, too much water and too little water and other kinds of relevant uh, risks. So in particular, in order to reduce damage and loss from flooding and enhance the adaptive capacity of the region, the establishment of a system for timely information and data sharing between countries or central government and local authorities, and also flood warning system is needed to be set up. But the current approach to water governance is really dominated by state-centric actors and is not delivering sustainable water management for people or ecosystems. They have established strong processes for governing transboundary water and are focused on maintaining the cyclical planning to construction of large infrastructure projects, for example, dams, uh, hydropower plants, bridge, etc. So these state-centric actors are focused on delivering water allocation, water use and management with a clear agenda, kind of the state has a duty to develop its water resources for national economic development. So for many, the state-centric actors are delivering the government agenda and therefore we cannot say it's not governance, that's managing transboundary water in Asia, but government. Right. So we so would like to really yeah. like making data and information available for all, as you said, and things transparent. And it's quite amazing how even data sharing can turn into very tangible results. And well, Chion, there are also very, uh, a lot of cross-cutting issues in development, and you're committed to achieving gender equality in the projects you're involved in as well. So, do you have any examples of how you are um, achieving this so-called gender mainstreaming? Yes. Uh, climate-induced disasters actually have been threatening to women. Uh, for example, 2004 Indian tsunami made around 230,000 fatalities, and 70% of the death was women. And the reason could be analyzed from our interview or kinds of the desk studies through literatures and kinds of fieldwork. From traditional social norm as a role of women who are most responsible for housework and family affairs for caring in developing countries. So for instance, in Northern Thailand, uh, women are fully accountable for securing water, even in times of scarcity, since it is their normal responsibility to procure water and they manage the household budget. Health problems of family members are very uh, burden for poor I mean, to poor water quality were found to increase their care work. And similar experience also found during hydropower resettlement adaptations to new settings where women are responsible for uh, their family's adaptation in new environment. And this kind of process for interviewing, we just found out uh, cases where domestic violence increased as a result of threatened masculinities attributed to the escalating livelihood insecurities when families experienced displacement or kinds of insettlement for their living. So in this kind of process, gender is gender equality is really cross-cutting perspective for solving this kind of issues. And we re really would like to in the, our project uh, gender mainstream needs to be more component for enabling environment for solving this water security and uh, disaster management. So in terms of really achieving uh, green goals, uh, global goals, you really have to make the process of it inclusive and um, equitable as well. And well, Kim, now you're working in a lot of European countries and also other countries, so other cities around the globe as well. And well, in Europe, there are many uh, common or similar labour and environmental standards, but you also work with uh, 
countries in different continents and municipal governments like the city of New York. What kind of changes or initiatives would you like to see through platforms like P4G to enable greater collaborations across the globe? Well, uh, I mean, from our experience, the uh, the P4G model uh, has proven uh, to be a viable one. Uh, uh, an example is is a project that we we actually did uh, with uh, uh, Korean partners, uh, JH Sustain and, and and GTC, focused on the on the Mekong Delta and the IoT, uh, as mentioned. But but P4G has a has an ambition also to uh, to to scale uh, solutions uh, and uh, and for that we need to uh, uh, to expand the, the the magnitude of the projects and also bring in um, other partners and a broader global uh, coverage uh, so so that would be beneficial uh, and and really facilitating these real partnerships uh, with uh, other organizations like uh, C40, uh, uh, the city organization, uh, the World Wildlife Fund, uh, different UN uh, agencies. Uh, they, they, uh, in terms of this, it's essential that we uh, that we not work in in silos, uh, but but learn from uh, from e across the initiatives, and uh, and because uh, Clean is an organization that that works uh, in various places around the globe, both in in Latin America and Asia and and, uh, and Europe, uh, as you said, and North America. Uh, we we hope to be able to be helpful uh, also there, bridging some uh, some gaps. Well, I'm afraid that's where we must leave it today. But thank you so much uh, for your time, Kim Friedrichland, CEO of Clean and Pak Dion, Managing Director of JH Sustain, for joining us today. Again, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.